marvelous uh, I've been also a workshop today and um, can you hear me? And it's been a real pleasure working with all of you and I hope some of the workshop participants are also here uh, at the presentation. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, from genomes to phenomes to the um, But first I would like to show you uh, our institute, the Royce Thompson Institute in the of New York. Um, which is on the, on the Cornell campus. And so if you come to Cornell, please come and visit. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our institute. Uh, as uh, the introduction uh, pointed out, I run the Soul Genomics Network. This is the homepage of the Soul Genomics Network. Uh, it's available at uh, soulgenomics.net. And many of the things I talk about are directly or indirectly related uh, to SGN. It has been one of my uh, Focus, uh, focuses uh, for, for a very long time. One of the major things that happened last year is that after about 10 years of work, we finally completed the tomato genome sequence. And it was published uh, in Nature uh, last year. And of course, I'm very proud to be one of the 350, one of the 350 co authors, so there's a long list of people who uh, contributed to that work. And, um, you know, finally, finally it's out there, and uh, of course it's available uh, from the SGM website. And you can download uh, all the data, you can blast the data, um, you have a genome viewer, and so on. Everything that you would expect from a, from a nice genome. Just to retrace a little bit the history of the tomato genome, it started, as I said, a long time ago, in 2004. Um, and uh, the initial uh, approach was uh, that we would sequence bats and we built the entire genome uh, from bats, which is a very tedious, uh, time consuming approach, but it was the current technology at the time. The progress was very slow, and people reached uh, gaps that they couldn't fill with, with uh, bats. And so in 2009, uh, we started a whole genome shotgun approach. Uh, using uh, mainly uh, the 454 technology, but also some other technologies we see. We built the genome using 454, using a, a nuclear assembler, and corrected, uh, polished some of the data, and integrated the bags that we have pre had previously sequenced into the final assembly. And we could build uh, chromosome level sequences using uh, genetic maps. And the final version of the assembly was version 2.4, had uh, all the sequences of less than 100 scaffolds, which were built into the 12 chromosome uh, pseudomolecules. So, this is a pretty high quality uh, sequence. Uh, it was annotated by a consortium called ITAC, the International Tomato Annotation Group. Uh, and the current version is uh, ITAC 2.3, is about 35,000. We are currently working on the next version of the genome assembly. Um, of course, we have more data. Um, uh, 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 a member of our group in the US, uh, Stephen Stack, he did a lot of fish and he could identify some scaffolds that we uh, did orient correctly because they're located in the heavenly property where genetic maps were very informative. Uh, and he could um, determine the correct position of these, um, these scaffolds. And um, we'll, of course, release a new version and uh, also re annotate uh, the genome. We also have a lot of uh, new sequence data that will integrate into the genome. So, what are we doing with the sequence data? So, last year, a researcher from Los Banos came to my lab, and um, it's just at the time that we started to think about. Uh, applications of the tomato genome, and uh, we were very lucky to have her in the lab. And we started this project uh, where we started to work with breeders and uh, obtained very advanced breeding lines from, from many breeders, uh, tomato breeders, uh, with novel resistances. And the example I want to tell you about uh, right now today uh, is a, a line that was contributed by a, a breeder uh, by the name of Doug Maxwell. Uh, and the line name was uh, GH13, and uh, it had a very uh, resistant, a very strong resistance to megaloviruses. <coughs> Megaloviruses are actually a very major uh, threat in some tropical, tropical countries, 
what this slide turned out to be was a sense of wide variety of uh, viruses. And um, GH14 was, was analyzed using the type of markers and so forth. Uh, it was used, analyzed using the SOCAP gene uh, chip as well. Um, and uh, Doc thought that it might be a good candidate for resequencing to identify the resistance genes uh, or to get a, a list of uh, genes, um, of candidate genes that could uh, provide the resistance because the nature of that resistance is completely unknown. And Douglas uh, also um, felt that he could give, uh, give away these seeds uh, so that we could um, uh, use that to write an NSF grant, uh, which we submitted and uh, it didn't get funded. But we have used this line as, um, uh, as a first uh, test uh, to, to develop what the pipelines needed to analyze uh, interbreast uh, regions in, in genomes. So this slide was actually created <coughs> using uh, wild relatives of tomato uh, for interpressions, uh, particularly hyperchites. Um, and uh, after a long breeding process of about six years, um, the breeders ended up with this slide called Foggy 9, which was then sent to uh, Dr. Maxwell. And these slides are very strong resistance. This is the uh, environment in Guatemala where, where Doug grows them. It's a, it's a very, uh, it, it's a good environment for screening for Bicoma viruses because it's very, uh, they're very present there and so lines of the resistance to grow there. Um, if you see here, uh, this is a, a GH13 line. Uh, and this is a commercial uh, hybrid line uh, that is uh, susceptible to the virus. So this line is, of course, uh, uh, resistant. So what, uh, what was known by all the work that has been done is that uh, uh, the, the line contained essentially two interpretations. One gene was uh, uh, labeled TY3, it was uh, based on chromosome 6 and it was interpressed from a wild species. Uh, we believe it's Chilensi and not Hyrochides, but Chilensi never really occurs in the pedigree of the, of the line. So we don't know exactly what happened. It also uh, contains the I2 gene, uh, which is on uh, chromosome 11 and uh, provides a fusarium resistance. And of course, it might contain other, other interpretations. <coughs> so the goal of, of this work was to resequence this line and determine the exact regions uh, of the interpretations and what genes were in these interpretations. So what we did is we we took the, the line and extracted the DNA and uh, used the Luna High Seq 2000 uh, exploration sequencing. Uh, one pair end line, uh, which gave us about a 20x coverage of, of that genome, and the cost uh, was $2,400 for that analysis. So it's very, very cheap compared to what it would have cost you know, even a few years ago. So uh, just a reminder, here's the, uh, how the, uh, the Lumina uh, paradigm system works. You basically share the DNA, you add adapters, you create these clusters on the chip surface, and then you sequence one end, then regenerate these clusters so that the other end is on the chip, and you sequence the other end. Uh, and that way, you generate paradigm and reads. So, Output, of course, is a large number of reads uh, that are paired. Uh, and then, you know, there are some challenges, like you will have regions that are global coverage. Regions might be very different from Heinz, so if we try to align these regions, uh, it might be very difficult to align them. So what we did is we uh, developed two uh, different uh, uh, pipelines to analyze this data. One pipeline was based on, on aligning sequence to the reference, whereas the other pipeline was designed to make a de novo assembly of uh, all the sequences. Now, de novo assembly is actually difficult with this amount of information. So most of the things I will talk about is from the uh, reference alignment, uh, alignment to the reference. 
we use the PWA to uh, align uh, the reads to the reference genome, and we called, uh, we identified all the differences between uh, the reference and this line. Uh, and these differences uh, are called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. We use a, a tool called SAMTools to do that. And then we can plot the SNP density uh, and uh, identify regions where we have very high SNP densities, which are potentially the regions of introgression. Um, the other thing you can do with the alignment is actually look at just you know, how, how deep your alignments are. Do you have any regions, uh, for example, that don't have any alignments? So that, that allows you to identify gaps uh, in the sequence. In the end, what we did, we, uh, we selected regions uh, for PCR, and we PCR uh, these regions from, from GH13, from the reference, and from wild lines, and built uh, phylogenetic trees to determine where the interpretations came from. So this is what it looks like when you plot all this information uh, on the genome. Um, so here on the top is that is you have to think of this as the, the reference sequence from hindsight 106. Of course, this is a very small fragment of the entire sequence. This is just a zoomed in little piece uh, 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 as a sample. And this is only about 100 kb, I think, the cost. Um, for the reference sequence here, uh, what is shown is the GC content, so you see how this varies. But there are no, no real uh, gaps in here, otherwise the GC content would go to zero. So this is actually a nice and continuous sequence in the reference. When you align the, the GH13 SNPs, you see that you know, the SNP density varies along the chromosome, so these are actually little triangles uh, in each genome of one SNP. Here you see the GH13. 13 uh, density of reads uh, on the genome, and you see that there are some areas where we don't have any reads. Uh, so here we can't really say anything. We don't really know why these gaps are there. It's a sequence that is not simply not there in the reference uh, in the, the GH13, or is it uh, uh, just by, by chance we didn't sample these regions and so forth? So we, we can't be sure about that. We also have uh, actually Illumina reads from uh, tomato and we align those as well. And sometimes you, hope you will see actual um, gaps there as well. And uh, that would indicate that, that in this region it, it's very difficult to align uh, these sequences because of reasons such as maybe they're very repetitive or, or something like that. And then we also looked at Pimpinella folio uh, and aligned those reads as well. And also determined all the snips between Pimpinella folio and uh, like person. So now when you plot the SNP density um, and uh, along the chromosomes, and you, for example, do that for chromosome 1, you see that uh, there is a pretty low SNP density uh, along the chromosome. There are some peaks here that are very narrow, and it's not quite clear what those are. Uh, I doubt that these are actually progressions. Uh, more likely they are regions of very repetitive sequence that are somehow compressed by either GH13 or in like a person home. And that's why we get these peaks. But if you look at chromosome 6, um, you see that we have a very clear peak here that's very, very broad. Um, and in the, lower, in the lower part of the chromosome, which is where we expect the introgression uh, as determined by, uh, by genetics. So we can zoom in and we can look at uh, what this region exactly is. Here, actually, when you look at this end uh, of the uh, of the introgression, we actually have a gap there. So something has happened there. We don't know exactly if it's a deletion or if it's a rearrangement that we can't see. Uh, but you, you can look uh, very precisely on the genome browser what what is in, uh, in this region here. So when we do that, uh, again, here's chromosome six and the introgression. Now, when we overlay uh, SNP information from Pimpinella folio, which is in red, uh, you can see that, of course, Pimpinella folio has a lot of SNPs, okay, with vis-a-vis uh, 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 like a lycoprosicone. Now, in this 
uh, graph what uh, Susie Assange has uh, painted the uh, uh, folium steps in red and the uh, GH13 steps in black. When uh, the GH13 and Pippinal folium steps overlap, they are actually painted in yellow. Okay? So you see that you actually have quite a few uh, snips that overlap between the two samples. Okay? So this is uh, GH13 and this is the, the overlapping ones. That means that this introgression here is probably not from Pippinal folium. Right? If uh, the yellow was as high as, as the black, it would probably mean uh, that it is Pippinal uh, folium because most of the snips are shared. We did that for uh, other chromosomes, for example, in chromosome 11, uh, we see two introgressions. And um, again, yellow is the shared ones with pippinella folium, and red is pippinella folium, and black is GH13. And you see that most SNPs are shared in, in these regions. So we think that these regions are um, from pippinella folium. The interesting thing is that there are two introgressions, and uh, I'm wondering whether this is uh, really true or whether there is a disassembly here and this piece maybe should be over there. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll fit, check that when we, when we uh, have the new, the new release of the genome. <coughs> so this is again chromosome 6, and when you look at uh, the exact interval where the uh, introgression is, it's actually from 30.6 to 34 uh, megabases on the chromosome. You can look up what markers are there in the genome, because all the markers are of course mapped to the genome, all the genetic markers. And uh, a lot of work has been done on the genetic markers uh, to identify the region of TY3. Now, there are several studies uh, that have been done and uh, one study uh, actually uh, determined this interval for TY3 and one study uh, determined this interval for TY1. Now what's very complicated with the genetic analysis is that there is an inversion uh, in the introgression. So it's very hard to analyze uh, that genetically. And people actually think that TY3 and TY1 is actually the same gene. But when you look at this interval here, uh, you can actually see that if you take the overlap of these two, it corresponds exactly to where our integration is located uh, with uh, physical means. So now we wanted to determine where these integrations came from. And when you look at chromosome 6 or chromosome 11, you can see that we have, you know, in green here, uh, underlines the, the non-peak regions and in red are the peak regions, right? So if I, if I would take, uh, 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 if I would create a PCR product from this region here and I would um, cluster it with a, like a person from sequence, they should cluster perfectly together because we have very few uh, SNPs vis-a-vis -vis like a person. Now in this region we have lots of differences so if I would cluster it, it should be further apart. And if we uh, take this region from a lot of other uh, wild relatives uh, and we draw a phylogenetic tree, we should actually be able to place that region very closely uh, to, uh, to, to the source uh, of, the, of the donor. And so we did that for both chromosome 6 
where you see a, a peak region. So this is the peak region first, that is the regression. And you can see that uh, GH13 actually does cluster with Pippin and Foley. Uh, where in the off-peak region, GH13 clusters with with Heinz. So there are other uh, regions uh, on um, in GH13 that would be interesting. For example, in chromosome 4, there is one kind of double integration again, but one seems to be clearly from Pippin and Foley again, and, and one seems to be from another wild species. And we really don't, you know, we haven't done any more work on these. Uh, that's the first uh, work that we'll do in the future. Look at, uh, do similar analysis uh, as with, uh, with the other interactions. So I want to um, change subject a little bit now and talk about uh, phenotypes. And uh, you know, we have done a lot of genetic work with these regressions. And, we have done a lot of genome sequencing, and obviously we need uh, a lot more sequence data. You know, when you look at these integrations, we have to do you know, PCR things, and it would be, of course, be convenient to just have all the reference wild species and to be able to look to just look it up, right, in the, the genome browser. And we aren't there yet, and uh, we're working on it. I guess a lot of people around the world are, are sequencing. But I think the other piece of the puzzle is really the phenotypes. If you want to know what all these regions uh, do uh, uh, in, in terms of biology, you need to uh, you need to know about uh, phenotypes. And so, uh, as Dr. Zamir always says, you know, we need phenotypes. We don't we don't need genotypes, right? <laughs> so, uh, phenotyping is really important, and we have done quite a lot of work in um, you know assembling and, and, and curating phenotypes. Uh, in, the SGM database, and I just want to talk a little bit about it very briefly. So, the thing with phenotypes is phenotype is actually hard because sequencing actually becomes pretty easy, right? Uh, you have seen for, for $2,000, you can sequence an entire genome, and you have you know perfect 2020 hindsight. Uh, you can see what the breeders have done, you can see all the integrations, and you can pretty much tell where they come from, uh, which is quite amazing. With phenotypes, it's hard because it's very labor-intensive phenotype. Uh, you have to standardize a lot. Uh, there are very many different people involved in phenotyping. Uh, and so what we have started doing um, at SGN is we have started to uh, build ontologies for solanacy phenotypes. Um, and an ontology is basically a structured vocabulary uh, that you know, contains uh, specific uh, ontology terms that describe phenotypes, and these are structured into a, uh, essentially a graph called a uh, direct asymmetrical graph. So you know the relationship between the different terms as well, which, which is, makes querying this uh, much more uh, uh, powerful. <coughs> so many uh, ontologies are currently developed, and I would just like to uh, mention uh, the uh, prop ontology of um, by Biodiversity International, uh, who will collect uh, for, for many, very many different species um, uh, um, phenotypic uh, and trait ontologies. Another one is the plant ontology, uh, which uh, allows you to specify uh, traits in combination with a, a, an ontology called Pedro. Um, what we have done, we have created our own trait ontology that we have mapped to plant ontology and we have submitted it uh, to the crop ontology of the website. It's very difficult actually to sometimes use a generic ontology to describe traits that are specific uh, to a species. For example, breeders that breed tomatoes um, have lots of different trait terms for the eyes of the tuber. Okay? And that's so specific, you won't find that ever in the plant ontology uh, uh, vocabulary. And so this is this was kind of our our um, motivation to create this, this ontology. So this is just a screenshot of the uh, crop ontology on our website and uh, all the all this and some of their 
this um, um, all the trait data in the database, and every every line that we phenotype has a has a uh, accession page uh, in the database, and it describes uh, all the features of the line. It describes you know who submitted the line. It has pedigree data in it. It has um, uh, it, they're grouped into uh, populations. Uh, there can be images uh, and so forth. And of course, there is uh, the phenotypic measurement. And so this is, for example, the phenotypic measurements of the line that's in the database. And each of these traits here, so this is the trait, these are our trait values. Uh, and each of the uh, traits is an is a entry into our ontology. Now, if we have both the trait data and the genotypic data, we could actually run some analysis right in the website. Uh, for example, we have a module that, that runs uh, QTL analysis right in the website. But it's still hard to get these um, phenotypes into the database. And so what we uh, are developing is a system where you can use uh, barcodes uh, to uh, store phenotypes in the field. So you take a barcode reader, you label your plants with barcodes that you can print from the website. And you have uh, barcode sheets that contain uh, barcodes for every trace that you want to measure and all the different trade values. Sometimes it's hard to design these because there are lots of values that we want to enter. Um, but then, uh, you know, all the data is in the, in the barcode reader. You can go back to your lab and upload it uh, to the website. And I think systems like this will, will be really necessary for, for us to get uh, really good straight data from the field. Another source of um, um, traits that we got in the database is from a, a project called the SoulCat project. It's a large USDA funded uh, project in the US, uh, a collaboration of uh, different universities. And uh, it had a focus on especially, essentially two plants, tomatoes and, and potatoes, and uh, defined uh, fairly large panels uh, of tomato and, and potato accessions, uh, 400 each, uh, that were uh, phenotyped uh, for uh, a set of uh, breeder you know, specific uh, traits. Much of our data in the database comes from this project. The other thing that this project did was actually create um, Affymetrics, uh, no, sorry, Illumina um, Infinium um, genotyping chips with about 8,000 uh, SNPs each. And so all these panels were uh, genotyped and phenotyped and, and also are available uh, in the database. Now, I think the future, though, is uh, genotype environment sequencing, uh, which is a new product, relatively new protocol that was developed in the Buffalo lab at Cornell. And uh, really, you know, what I showed you before, we sequenced the entire genome. That's, of course, $2,400. That's really a little bit too expensive for, for genotyping, especially if you do it in the uh, context of a breeding program. So what you do with um, in genotyping by sequencing, basically, we reduce the sequence space uh, using uh, restriction, uh, and then you can use highly multiplexed uh, MGS approaches uh, to get the genotypic data. So, in a sense, how this works is you have different samples and you restrict the samples. So, uh, it, it, instead of sequencing all this, this entire blue line, you only sequence these little reads here. So, you see that there's a huge uh, reduction in the sequence, uh, and you store then uh, differences in these uh, little sequences, which are 100 base pair long, um, or you also can uh, characterize the loss of, of concepts because of uh, um, the restriction side that is this here. So this uh, actually becomes quite cheap when you do a lot of multiplexing. So. Uh, <coughs> The cost is about thirty dollars if you run forty-eight samples on a lane, but um, now you can run you know, three hundred eighty-four uh, lines uh, per per lane, uh, and the cost becomes really quite cheap. And if you think about it, a, a gene chip, a gene chip is still something fairly expensive. It costs hundred dollars uh, to buy, and then you need to process it. You can see that here the sequencing cost is actually the green part. The green part is all this small fraction. 
of the, of the actual analysis. So that brings us to the interesting problem of storing genotypic data. It turns out that this is, uh, if, you, if you do a lot of it, uh, your amounts of data become just gigantic. It's a real problem how to store this data. Um, because usually people store uh, sequence, so sequence data or other types of data in a relational database. Uh, when you store, uh, actually this data is not huge in the sense that it's huge in terabytes, but it's huge number of data points. If you uh, make a relational database table with one billion rows in it, uh, the relational database will just stop the function. Too, but it's too much, you can't handle it. Um, so we need to find other new technologies to store this data. And so uh, one promising approach is uh, to actually store this data not in a billion rows, but you know, store, compress the data into strings and store the strings uh, in a relational database. But then there are new formats uh, of non-relational, non-SQL databases uh, are becoming available, such as uh, HDR5, uh, which is a system that has been used for a long time in physics uh, to store a huge amount of uh, astronomical data, uh, things like that. So this, this is what we apply now for uh, digital typing data. We also created a new uh, database schema to store this information uh, together with uh, uh, other databases, uh, the database for Rosacea and vector base and, and others. So this is now a standard schema for storing uh, diversity of uh, data. So how can we improve reading uh, with all these new technologies? Uh, the, the, the way reading technologies have evolved is we went from a phenotypic selection to marker assistive reading. And now I think the next step is going to be a paradigm called uh, genomic selection. So what is uh, genomic selection? Basically, it's a paradigm that removes uh, phenotyping from the line development. Again, phenotyping is very costly, uh, it's slow, uh, and what we do with uh, genotypic selection is you basically model uh, the genome and uh, the phenotypes that it can generate. Um, so you uh, basically build a model that can predict phenotypes from genotypes. But this is how it works. So what you do is uh, you have a so-called uh, model training cycle where you phenotype and you genotype your lines and you build a statistical model that you know, links genotypes to phenotypes. In your uh, line development cycle, you only genotype. And uh, using this model, you then, from the genotype, you predict the phenotype and you advance your lines based on these predictions. Obviously, your predictions have to be good, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay? So, um, you will have to, from time to time, verify and, and do some phenotypic measurements as well in, in this circle and feed them back in uh, uh, to improve your model and, and make sure that the model So <clears throat> what we've decided is that we should uh, implement the system uh, in, in our uh, database as a tool and what you should be able to do is you should be able to calculate uh, GS models in, in, the, in, uh, in the tool and predict the phenotypes. So we have seen this accession page uh, and, and so the idea would be that on the accession page you can choose a model and you will be able to see its reading values, its predicted reading values and, and it would allow you to select uh, the lines uh, for further reading. This, of course, uh, brings with it uh, a lot of other kind of desires. For example, you know, being able to manage a lot of aspects of the reading project. For example, uh, being able to uh, manage crosses, uh, pedigrees, uh, field layouts, uh, sample collection, and data collection. So we have uh, created a system uh, that uh, I think allows you to do most of that, not all of it yet, but uh, we're working hard on it so that we can uh, basically manage a reading project 
tribe data, location data, process, phenotypes, and phenotypes. So, conclusions. Um, I think genome databases you know, need to adapt to be two years. I think that's the next step. Um, I think genotyping by sequencing and, and combination with uh, genomic selection will be one of the key tools uh, that will ensure the next step of breeding. Uh, and of course, we need a lot of bioinformatics. Uh, we need uh, a lot of genomes. We need a lot of the wild tomato genomes, for example. Uh, we need a lot of genotypic data and databases that can deal with phenotype data. Uh, we need genotypic data. For example, and we need to implement the algorithms and the functions that we use. These are the people who work uh, in my lab and uh, have done most of the work that I talked about. Um, I would especially like to point out that Nama did the analysis of the GH13 uh, together with uh, Susie and Jeremy implemented the, the breeder functions in the database. Uh, Isaac um, implemented, um, has implemented the genomic selection algorithms and has implemented the QTI tools. Okay, that's all. <laughs>
uh, there are some genes in there that you know are candidates, but there are lots, lots of them. Uh, so we could narrow it down to a single gene. But uh, Sam Hutton and uh, Jay Scott, uh, they have actually done more analyses and they have the gene. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know which one it is, <laughs> but it's definitely in there. I guess the, those different TY genes mostly were derived from QGL mapping. So some of those, after annotating with the full genome sequence, they may be actually one whole piece of calidin gene. So uh, they just have more or less characterized the TY6. So it, it is uh, for publication. So, follow up question? From size students. I see what am I I'm trying to look around for here. Question 106, ABT 106. Anyway, any question please? Anything from genome to phenome to breeding, right? <laughs> it spans quite a large territory. Uh -huh. Or would you like to question if he's uh, coming for a uh, grad student or that can be asked too, right? Anything. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> yes. Uh. Hi. Um, good afternoon. I'm Maida Nameto from Kiri. And it was a pleasure to see the cosmetology uh, website because actually uh, I think the developer of that was my former boss. Uh -huh. yeah. yes. And also helping with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're in the process also of building a rice weeding database and we're thinking of um, integrating some data from the crop ontology database. Um, uh, I note what you said that there are some traits that are not yet in in this collection. And why not? Um, how is the um, collaboration? Um, you submit these new traits with this group, and they kind of like um, made a curation. So, so the the, the, the chromatology. Uh Crop ontology ontologies should actually contain most of your traits of interest. And if they're not there, they will just, you know, you can contact them, they will add them, you know, the person very well, who wants them very well. Uh, what's more difficult is with the plant ontology, I think because it's more of a generic ontology. Um, I don't think they would want to put in things like, you know, ear trait, uh, I mean, uh, potato uh, eye traits, and things like that. Um, but that, that's okay because it's, it has a different application. It's more of a unifying ontology, and what we do is we map our ontology to the plant ontology, and um, you know you, you you lose a lot of the fine structured information when you do that. For example, uh, in, in our uh, ontology for tomato, we have for solanaceae we have fifty fruit shape shape traits, fruit shape, right? Um, and they're very hard to express uh, any, any other way. And so when we, when we map them to the plant ontology, you know, they just they just say food chain. They don't say anything else. You know, they don't say oblong or you know. Uh, sometimes they do. You, you can specify certain simple uh, form uh, traits. Uh, but when you map them back, they become much much simpler uh, traits. But that's okay because you want to compare them. You know, the, uh, the, the goal is to compare from very, very different uh, over you know, maybe very uh, distant phylogenetic relationships. And all these traits would make any sense anyway over these. You know, you want to you want to find genes that affect food shape. You know, you, uh, you don't want to be too specific. Uh, and so that function is, is very well suited for plant ontology. Whereas if you are a breeder and you describe your crop, you want to have something very specific, right? The breeders want 
very specific traits that they can get them through the corporate coalition. So we found a balance between uh, providing the flexibility for the readers to provide their own variables, for example, and um, still being able to collaborate with the larger consortium. Exactly. And I think that the key, the key is mapping, mapping the different ontologies, and you can get the best of both worlds. Oh, by the way, we're using web services to get to That would be also good for, for at least for the system that we're building. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, do you use web services? We, we would like to use more of them. Yes, right. definitely. We don't, we don't do that much right now. But uh, we should make a talk after this. Perfect. Yes. I, I have some question. Um, you may have from the Philadelphia group of the, the International Rights Research Institute. And you mentioned something about uh, using a predictive tool to get rid of the human life being just slow. So what kind of algorithms are you actually using for the prediction of Philadelphia? Uh, so we are using something called uh, RRLOP, it's an R implemented uh, uh, system that uh, kind of is correlation uh, of geotypes and geotypes. It's called RRLOP. Yeah. Best uh, linear predictive. Uh, is this part of some neural networking or does the logic came up? No, no, it's, it's actually a fairly simple statistic, actually. So it's nothing like, uh, it, it's, just, it's just basically a, a correlation. It's not more than that. Um, what's the measure of accuracy? I'm curious to use that. Yes. You use that predicting phenotype. Yeah, of course, you have to, uh, you have to check if, if it's accurate. And of course, you can do that by uh, you know, taking subsets of phenotype lines and uh, comparing predictions with the actual phenotype. Of, it turns out that it's kind of quite accurate. It depends on, on the specific traits that you're looking at. You know? I mean, it, it depends on the characteristics of traits and their you know, genome environment interactions and, and things like that. So uh, it, won't, it won't work with just any trait, but I think certain traits can be applied. It has been shown to be working very well. Any other question? And I remember also with the predictive uh, modeling is as long as you have uh, checking with your core population, your breeding program, any new addition if it's really different uh, genotypes, then probably have you retest again. That's why in the circular, time to time you have to bring your population to, to the training uh, uh, training lines to, to again check the model. The addition of uh, genotype or gene pool, then you see if it's still the same predictive value you are getting. So that's why it's a circular thing. Yeah. Any? Yes. I'm Merwin from this company. I just want to ask that you cited in the slides uh, the two uh, possible uh, database relational database, which is uh, SQL, and the other one is HDFI. Have you tried to implement or receive the data in HDFI for files? Yeah, so um, it's kind of uh, a little bit in a development stage right now. Uh, we will only store very specific SNP data in HDFI format. And all the metadata will be in, in the relational database. Um, HDFI is not good for storing complex relationships. It's, it's good for uh, you know, huge matrices of data. For example, you know, the, the skin analysis are usually just a giant matrix, right? You know, it's a matrix that has 10,000 rows and 50,000 lines for each line of the data. So for that kind of data, uh, HFI is really excellent. But if you want to store pedigrees, for example, you can't do it in HFI. Uh, are you developing uh, category methods for HFI, for example, for the Yeah, the query interface is very simple. You basically can get rows and columns and sub, you know, sub matrices uh, for the big matrix. Do you have any API or any Yeah, so 
uh, I, I've developed a, a little, uh, actually, web services space interface to an HDF5 file. Um, and you can, it, what, what it allows you to do is read, read out the rows and columns of information on that. So you can't, you can't get a, a, an arbitrary sub-matrix out of the HDF5 file. But I think in most cases, the you know, full rows and full columns for the analysis. Uh, so that exists in its own uh, GitHub. Uh, so, 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 so.